It is a great pleasure to be with you this morning as we welcome the 1980 Astros panel. These four gentlemen brought the National League West Championship pennant here to our home team, and over the years they have been responsible for having a continuing impact on our team and on our community. As Sabre members, I think a lot of us are dedicated readers. And as readers, we depend on the writers and the reporters who bring us their analysis and their commentary on the games. So to lead our panel this morning, we have moderator Kenny Hand. Kenny has almost 40 years in the baseball reporting, writing business, columnist for many years, many awards. And uh, we're just delighted to have Kenny here this morning to uh, bring us these four gentlemen. So take it away. Thank you very much, and thanks everybody for uh, turning out. See Johnny Smith over there, Tal's uh, wife. It reminds me a lot of 1980. I was covering the Astros for the Houston Post back then, and I had come from Dallas, and they still welcomed me with open arms even though I came from Dallas. Uh, it was a magical, remarkable year. We're going to get you guys in and out, I promise, in one hour. But we've got a lot of experience doing that, so we'll get it down to uh, precision and, and get you in and out. But we're going to enjoy this hour because it was one of those years, a lot of people thought the 1980 Astros overachieved, and I don't think so. I don't think it was overachieving at all. I think it was just achieving. And if not for a series of things that happened, including the loss of J.R. Richard, who was the most dominant pitcher in the game, uh, going down with a stroke in the middle of the year, I think this team would have beaten the Phillies and would have gone on and beaten the Kansas City Royals and would have been world champion. We're going to talk about how this team was assembled. There's a science to it. It's not by accident. And the architect was a gentleman uh, to my right that I'll introduce in a minute, Tal Smith. Uh, but I'm going to introduce a couple of players here and the hitting coach for the Astros in 1980 because this it was not an accident how this team was put together and uh, how it executed properly, uh, the speed and the defense and the pitching. And we've got two of the offensive players here that were a big part of the defense as well. We're right down to the end, I think this guy uh, in many ways was the glue to the Houston Astros in 1980. He was fearless, grew up in California, born in Kansas, but came up in the Baltimore Orioles organization and I first saw him as a kid growing up in Arlington. And he played for the old Dallas Fort Worth Spurs double-A team. And Enos was a beanpole. He was probably 150 soaking wet with maybe some cement attached to his shoes back then. But we could all tell as kids coming up in the Baltimore organization, which was the, uh, the uh, Spurs with a farm club for Baltimore back then, and we could tell at the old Turnpike Stadium as a double-A player, I said, it's not just Bobby Gritch, and it's not just Cal Ripken Sr., the coach of the uh, Spurs at the time in, in, in Arlington. Um, this is a good organization, and look at this guy. He's 150 pounds soaking. Look at him hit the ball hard, and look at him run, and look at him feel. And so when the Astros wound up trading for him, I knew that they had somebody special when I came down here in 1977 to cover the team. Enos had a, a lifetime batting average of 277, 1,647 hits, 596 RBIs, played for five teams in the big leagues, Astros twice, uh, Baltimore, the Giants, the Tigers, and uh, finished up with the Dodgers, stints with the Astros in 75 to 80, and also from 84 to 85. It was the Astros' most valuable player in 1978, and um, he played 15 seasons in, uh, in the big leagues and was inducted into the Astros Hall of Fame as well. He's currently the special assistant to uh, general manager uh, Jeff Luno with the Astros. Ladies and gentlemen, Enos Cabell. Uh, we think of great Puerto Rican players in baseball like Roberto Clemente, and he was probably the best ever, but also a hero in his country for as long as he played 19 years in the major leagues, is number 25. His numbers are tired by the Astros, and, and there's no mistaking why it would be. 284 lifetime average, 
2,251 hits, 165 home runs, and 1,077 runs batted in. When Cheo uh, Cruz, and that's what they called him lovingly, Cheo, that was his nickname, um, he played in more games than any other Astro, 1,870 games before Craig Biggio passed that record in 2001. And Cheo had about, he was first or second in about 11 offensive records for the Astros um, until uh, also Biggio and, and some other people passed him. But he still has the Astros record for uh, triples with 80, and he had six walk-off home runs, which uh, is a, an all-time best. Chael Cruz, to me, and I covered baseball a long time, is one of the best pure hitters I've ever seen in baseball. If he played for the Yankees, he did at the end of his career, but if he'd played a lot of his years with the Yankees or the Dodgers, maybe a little bit better, a bigger media market at the time, I think he'd have been more of a legendary figure. The one thing I'll ask him about and, and, and is uh, as a two-strike count, I don't think I've ever seen better hitters than Cheo and Enos Cabell. But Cheo, 19 years in the big leagues, uh, he's in the Hispanic Heritage Museum Hall of Fame, the Texas Baseball Hall of Fame, and he was selected as one of the three outfielders on the all Astrodome team. Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Jose Cruz. That, of course, was a nod to the late J. Fred Duckett, who was a wonderful PA announcer at the Astrodome, a close friend of everybody's here. Um, one of the uh, most fun people that we ever met with the Astros over the years and a, and a terrific hitting coach, why wouldn't he have been? Uh, he had 11 great seasons in the minor leagues and really a serious shoulder injury in the mid-50s kept Deacon Jones from probably being a really, really good major league uh, hitter, but Deacon played for the uh, White Sox organization. He was from New York, and when he came here to the uh, uh, Astros, uh, he was the hitting coach in 1980. And if everybody uh, would listen to Deacon, he was a mild mannered guy, very soft spoken, but he had a lot of good ideas on how to get out of a slump or approaches to hitting. And it was very calm. It wasn't. Um, and it wasn't sporadic. Deacon had a, an idea of what he wanted to do with every individual guy. And it wasn't a, it was like a, I think to me, like you, you see golf instructors with one approach to trying to teach a golf swing. And the best ones are the, are the ones in golf that adjust to each individual woman or guy in the golf swing. And Deacon did that to me, uh, in my view, with baseball, with trying to get a guy out of a hitting slump. He would use what the guy had and not try to make him George Brett or Reggie Jackson. He tried to make, and he was very successful doing that. <clears throat> he is now, <laughs> Deacon is now the uh, 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 special assistant to the Sugarland Skeeters. Deacon Jones. Uh, Two things. His his real name is uh, is Grover, but he didn't like anybody calling him Grover, and he got confused sometimes with the football Deacon Jones. Uh, but like Deacon said, I was the original Deacon Jones. I was older, <laughs> and, and he, I, I didn't want to forget Enos Cabell as well. Also, dead. <laughs> and I forgot about uh, Enos is also a special assistant uh, to the uh, general manager for the Astros now. So I forgot to mention that the architect of the Astros um, has made three tours of duty with the Astros, and it first happened in 1960 when he came down from Cincinnati with the legendary GM for the Reds, Gabe Paul, and the Astros um, were going to be formed as a Colt 45s, an expansion team, along with the New York Mets back then. And uh, no one knew in Houston at the time how lucky they were going to get with the baseball knowledge that Tal Smith would have. It probably started because he's a dookie, and so you start immediately with that kind of intelligence level. Now, I went to Texas Arlington, so I couldn't compete with that. But we did have a lot of fascinating conversations over the year. And Tal joined the Astros in 1960. He had so much to do with the construction of the Astrodome, which if you noticed last night and all the flooding in town in Houston, that's why this thing got built. Um, he became uh, an executive with the Yankees briefly in the, in the 70s before coming down for his second tour 
of duty as general manager of the Astros in the mid-70s. It's a team that had lost um, a bunch of games, 100 games. They were 43 and a half games out when Tal took over in August of 75 with Bill Verdon, whom he brought down with him from the Yankees. And we're going to talk today about the blueprint that was five years in the making, but it ended in the Astros' first championship team. He later came back to the Astros again under the Drake McLean administration, and that was capped off in 2005 with the Astros' first World Series appearance. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Tal Smith. If I can inject a word here before Kenny continues, I'm really sorry that the manager of that club, Bill Burden, a very dear friend, and the skipper of our first championship club. I'm sorry Bill couldn't be here. He wanted to be here. Uh, he lives in Springfield, Missouri, and Bill was being honored uh, uh, last night at the ballpark in Springfield, which is in the Texas League, uh, with his own bobblehead. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't wait to see that. So I, 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 I hope we all get, all get one. But he, he sends his very best, and I, I wish he could be here because he was obviously such a major component of that 1980 team and uh, the teams before that and, and after. Thank you. Well, and Tal has spent 54 years in baseball. As you can tell, he has a very deep voice, which would have been good for broadcasting and being in the media, but he decided to actually do something uh, poignant and important with his life. So he got into <laughs> baseball administration. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about how this team got assembled, what made it as good as it did, and we're going to start um, with Tal, when you came back from New York and you see this team that's 43 and a half games out, the Astros were formed in 1962 as the Colt 45s. They played, for those of you who don't know, real quickly, they played in uh, a, a, a temporary stadium called Colt Stadium. It was outside where the mosquitoes would carry off your young, <laughs> and uh, the humidity and the rain would be just just such a nuisance. And so Judge Roy Hoffines here, the owner of the uh, Astros, decided that they were going to build a dome stadium in Houston. And for all the slings and arrows that it's gotten in subsequent years when it's run down, it, it, was, a, it was a genius thing to be the first dome stadium because I don't think baseball on the major league level would have ever succeeded in Houston without the dome stadium. And Tau was a big part of that. And when it was originally formed, they had a grass field and then the grass died because of the glass roof. And so we're talking about 1965 when the dome opened and the teams that were put around that with um, some veteran players from the expansion draft. Tal, when you get here in 75, you've got to come up with a blueprint for the dome, which is now about uh, 10 years old. And how do you and Bill go about putting the pieces together that leads to this championship in 80? Well, as Kenny said, that was a real challenge. The 1975 Astros uh, uh, lost uh, 97 games and finished, as Kenny said, 43 and a half games out, and that was the uh, worst record in the team's history up until the 2011 season and the recent uh, rebuilding and reorganization. Uh, you, know, you know, to me, I'd only been gone a couple of years, and I'd, I'd lived with this franchise from its inception in, 19, in the in the uh, fall of 1960 up until the time I went to the Yankees in the fall of 1973. So I hadn't been gone long. And uh, frankly, I really enjoyed the Yankee experience that uh, there's nothing from a historical standpoint uh, like, uh, like the history of the Yankees. But this was an opportunity to, to come back home and uh, well, not, not that it had a special meaning. Obviously, I had followed the club very closely. I was familiar with, uh, with the personnel and uh, it, it was a club that presented a challenge because they had, they had acquired uh, a nucleus of some fine young talent, uh, but there was a blend also of uh, players who had rendered fine service but had probably reached the peak of their major league careers and were on the downhill ascendancy. Uh, so from an overall standpoint, I, it's, it's my personal belief that it stands in rebuilding you have to do it in stages because if you're going to uh, dispose of certain players because of age or other considerations, you have to have replacements ready. 
And uh, that's not something that, in my judgment, can be immediately done. So we, we tried to take this in stages. And uh, we, did, uh, we did have to part with a lot of players who had played very well for the Astros over a number of years. But we, as I said, we did it in, uh, in a sense in varying stages. Uh, Doug Rader and Roger Metzger and Tommy Helms and Milt May and Dave Roberts, the left-handed pitcher, and, and uh, many others. Uh, but uh, as it stands to assemble a club, and I thought there was a good nucleus here, but to me, uh, you put a team together, it's, it's great to have superstars, and they can obviously, obviously dominate uh, as it stands on occasion, uh, but you also have to complement that with a well-rounded team. I'm a believer, uh, as basically and particularly because of the Astrodome, in building a team on pitching speed and defense. Uh, pitching, I think, uh, obviously is the most important factor in any one uh, game. And uh, speed and defense are something that are more predictable than, uh, uh, as it stands, than, than pitching may be in some cases, and certainly than offense is. Uh, speed rarely disappoints you. It's something that could pay dividends on uh, both sides of the equation, offensively and defensively. Playing in the Astrodome, obviously, as Kenny has pointed out, uh, you, you, know, you have to take that into consideration when you're building a club. The dimensions of the Astrodome were vast. Center field, 406 feet. Uh, the ball is not going to be aided by uh, stand by wind velocity or anything of that nature. Uh, stand by that time, obviously, we had AstroTurf. Uh, that makes for a fast infield. Uh, and so you, you, uh, you take these things into consideration. And I also believe it, that it's important to provide a manager and a coaching staff with flexibility, uh, with, uh, with players that can play more than one position. You're going to run into injuries during the season. And, it, it, and uh, I, th I think your bench and the versatility that provides is very important. And that was something that we set out to do when we were assembling this club in, uh, in, in various stages. Uh, chronologically, we, we started, and I'll try to go through this because uh, uh, I certainly want to hear from the, from the players that were so instrumental in Cheo and Enos and Deacon's views as a, as a very important member of the, uh, of the staff. But uh, it chronologically uh, stands to go through it. Uh, so we ended up in 1980 with, with a club that really had a lot of stability. We played an entire season despite uh, the, uh, uh, the tragedy of, uh, as stands of losing JR in mid-season and the other aches and pains and injuries you have during the season. Basically, we played that year with 29 players on the roster that played 10 or more games. It's somewhat surprising in, in today's uh, pitching staff. We went through that. Bobby Sproul made, made one appearance, pitched one inning. Aside from that, there were only 12 pitchers that made an appearance for that club during the entire season. Clubs today carry 12 and 13 pitchers on their staff. And, uh, 25. <laughs> uh, uh, from a position player standpoint, again, we had great stability. Uh, a total of 17 position players that played 10 or more games during that season. So basically, you had 12 pitchers and 17 players that contributed, and some of those were as a result of JR going down and other injuries where you had to call people up and so on and so forth. But basically, uh, we, you know, you know Cheo was here, Enos was here, Cesar Cedeno was here. Uh, Morgan. Uh, well, uh, Terry Poole. Uh, Poole. Terry. Uh, and Terry Poole yeah. had just come up. Uh, and one, because the Yankees actually tried to trade for him when they gave permission for me to come back to Houston. Uh, the Yankees asked for Terry Poole in return. <laughs> Good thing you didn't give it to him. <laughs> Fortunately, the answers didn't agree to it. Yeah. Uh, but, and, uh, but anyway, uh, same way, uh, the, uh, uh, the first trade we really made was uh, shortly after I came back at the end of the 1975 season, we acquired Joaquin Andohar. Andohar uh, at, that, uh, at that time was just, was just a young pitcher. We had good reports on him and uh, the Reds made him available. We liked what we knew about him and added him, and Joaquin became a very important and a very uh, personable uh, oh. part, a part of that <laughs> club, and Deacon and Ian Cheo can speak more to that later, because the personality of this club was really, was really unique, and I think that had a lot to do with its winning, but I'll leave that up to others to address. But Joaquin was the first guy we added to the cast. Uh, and then uh, also during that offseason, between 75 and 76, able to pick up Art Howe from the Pirates. They wanted Tommy Helms. Uh, we went through our reports and so on. 
uh, selected Art Howe. When I speak of versatility, there's a great example. Art could play first, second, third, and was a key component of our club, largely uh, staying responsible offensively for what drove in four runs in the, uh, in the deciding playoff game uh, to clinch the National League pennant. Uh, in 1977, uh, we traded Cliff Johnson. And, and again, you have to tailor a club to your needs. Cliff, ideally, is a DH. National League didn't have a DH. Uh, Yankees, uh, Yankees do, uh, and, and, and Cliff served them very well, particularly in the postseason. We picked up Dave Bergman, who played a key part. When we talk about versatility, uh, you know, Dave, uh, Dave a first baseman, uh, sent good left-handed bat off the bench. Picked up Randy Neiman, who became a left-handed reliever that played a role in 1980. Mike Fishlin, who had seen some service uh, as a utility infielder uh, when needed. Uh, later on, we had Willie Crawford. We acquired him. Uh, again, something, <laughs> Willie had a fine career, but didn't fit into our long-range plans. Charlie Finley was at Oakland. Uh, he expressed interest in, in uh, Stans and Willie, and I asked, well, who do you have available? And uh, he, uh, he, there was a young player, Denny Walling, who was on the disabled list with a broken wrist, as I recall, at that, at that time. And checked our reports, and okay, he's not able to render service right now, but this is somebody, left-handed bat, versatility, outfield, third base, first base, so on. So, so we added Walling, and he became a key part. These aren't necessarily stars, but they were guys that really played important roles in the composition of the 1980 club. Uh, in spring training 1978, Vern Rule became a free agent released by the Tigers. I had seen, when I was with the Yankees, I had seen Vern pitch against the Yankees, uh, the Yankees at that time playing at Shea Stadium. I uh, and remembered that, talked to some people. We signed Vern, uh, center of the minor leagues, to, to, get, uh, to get back in, uh, to get his arm back in condition and so on. And Vern was instrumental in 1980 when JR went down with, with, uh, with his stroke. Uh, in midseason, Vern went under the starting rotation and uh, and and was a key it was uh, it was a key factor in uh, in us winning. Uh, also, later in 1978, uh, the, the Dodgers uh, had an injury. Steve Yeager, as I recall, got hurt. They had Yeager and Johnny Oates uh, backing him up. Al, uh, and Joe Ferguson was on our club. We had acquired him from St. Louis earlier and in exchange for Larry Durker, and, uh, and uh, Ferguson had been a Dodger originally. Al Campanis liked, liked him, and Tommy Lasorda liked him. Uh, so again, uh, we, we sparred back and forth with Campanis. He had a real need, and uh, we felt we could, we, we, could, we could let Joe go, and in return, we got Jeff Leonard and Rafael Landestoy. Not, not big names, not stars but important components of a club we were putting together. Landestoy in 1980 played second base in short, pinch ran, was a, was a, and made key contributions. Jeff Leonard, the same thing. Right-handed hitter, outfielder, played an important role. These are the pieces that we put together. Uh, later on, uh, as a result of trading Ferguson and, and, and Roger Metzger, we felt the two, two key needs we need were catching and shortstop. That's what we needed in, in, in the collective judgment of, of, of Bill and the coaching staff and the office, and we set out to, to cure, cure that. And we, uh, you look at all the possible uh, catchers and shortstops might be available. We ended up acquiring Alan Ashby, and uh, along with Gary Woods uh, from Toronto for Mark Lemangelo and three, three younger players. And, uh, and later on at the uh, winter meetings, about a month after that, uh, talked to uh, Talked to Seattle, uh, followed Craig Reynolds. Craig had gone to high school here, local product, signed with Pittsburgh, traded to Seattle, felt he might be available. Young, young player, good defensive shortstop, uh, handled the bat very well. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was gonna cost a lot. Floyd Bannister had been the Astros' first 1-1, and a first round pick, number one selection in that first round out of Arizona State. Floyd, uh, Floyd uh, is a left-handed pitcher, starter, had advanced very quickly through our system, pitching at the major league level, went on to have a very fine career, won something like 130 or 140 games in the big leagues. But again, when you're putting a club together, it went, what we needed a shortstop. We had what we f felt was, uh, was uh, some depth in the pitching staff, as later proved correct. And so that was sort of uh, the, uh, the last 
uh, last piece of position players that we needed. Then the two big free agent acquisitions at the end of 1979, Nolan Ryan, of course, that speaks for itself. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that was, uh, he became the first million dollar signee and well worth it uh, from a standpoint of what he represented to the Astros. And then uh, later on, after the first of the year in 1980, Joe Morgan also become a free agent at Cincinnati, a most valuable player two years in a row for the Reds, always distressed uh, when we traded him initially uh, to Cincinnati. Uh, now this is, uh, this is seven or eight years later, and uh, we had Joe come, uh, come down to visit uh, with us. Uh, Bill Verdon flew down from Springfield. I met with Tom Rich, uh, Joe's agent. Bill and Joe talked about the possibilities. Here's a player now no longer at the height of his career. <coughs> coming into a, uh, in, 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 into a club uncertain as to how he might be utilized and wanted to make sure he would be comfortable with them. And Bill is very direct in that, and he, he covered all kinds of scenarios. And uh, why not, but to make a long story short, Joe uh, uh, Stans agreed uh, to sign as a free agent and added a great veteran presence along with his physical ability and contributions to that 1980 club. So that was pretty much it, adding Andohar, Howe, Bergman, Walling, Rule, Leonard, Landestoy, Ashby, Reynolds, Ryan, and Morgan. With the exception of, 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 of Ryan, with all due respects to the other players, they weren't great stars, but they were real solid ball players and really fit what we were trying to do. Thank you, Tell. And we're going to walk everybody through this 1980 season with Enos and Cheo Cruz and, and Deacon Jones. Uh, it started with a rotation of Joe Necro, Ken Forsh, Nolan Ryan, J.R. Richard, and then Vern Rule came on and won 12 games and lost four uh, after J.R. was hurt. But this is a key statistic for you guys. You'll love this one. You know how complete games are pretty much something out of the past. Dallas Keuchel with the Astros had his fourth complete game the other night, and he, that means that the Astros have four complete games right now, and we're in August. <laughs> But that's not unusual. Everybody has very few complete games on a staff. The 1980 Astros staff, Negro Force, Ryan, Richard, and Rule, 31 complete games on that staff. Now you take in De Joe Sambito, Dave Smith, Frank LaCorte out of the bullpen, locked down relief pitching. You talk about Enos and Chael and you had an outfield of Chael Cruz, who turned himself into a remarkably good left fielder, Cesar Cedeno and Terry Poole. There weren't anything, uh, there weren't many fly balls or liners that got through. Nothing in the gap. They chased it all down. Infield was solid. And let's start with Enos. And let's talk about Enos, the makeup of the 80 team, what made it so good. You were fearless. You were a special guy. It wasn't just your numbers but it was what you were in the clubhouse as a leader. And let's talk about when the team ever got down, and uh, we're talking about Bill Verdon and his leadership not allowing anybody to not run out a ground ball to first base. Start there. <laughs> well, that, really that started probably when, when Tao came back and then we ended up hiring Bill Verdon. Uh, at that time, we had let a lot of the older veterans go. And it was, if you hit the ball, sometimes you ran the first and sometimes you didn't. Uh, jogging, uh, not going from first to third, and we're playing in Astrodome, and a lot of you that are old as me understand that in Astrodome, it was tough really to hit the ball out of the park. So you really needed speed. And when Tal and Bill came, it became a stress that you run. Uh, we had certain situations where if you didn't run the first base, Bill Verdon would have you come out the next morning at 8 o'clock, dressed in your uniform, but no gloves, no bats, no balls. All you did was run. We ran for an hour. It got to be where if you didn't run the first base, that was the keyest thing in the whole world because nobody wanted to play a game at night and then get up at 7 o'clock to be there at 8 to go run for an hour. And then you still have to play the game. So it was almost a changing of what the playing pattern was there. It was we play hard, we run, and let it fall where it may. So 
the whole system had to be changed, torn down, as Tal had talked about, and the change had started. Uh, I think that year in 75, I think I came in 75, Cheo came in 75, Joe Negro came in 75, which really pointed to almost the changing of the guard. Uh, we had old guys and all they did was drink. I mean, <laughs> I mean that was just the writers. <laughs> I don't see nothing wrong with it because I drink a little bit. <laughs> but they drank. I mean, it was, <laughs> so uh, it was a changing. Uh, it was where we got to where the most important thing was winning. We didn't care who got the damn hit, long as somebody got a hit, and we won a game. Uh, the changing started with all of the moves that Tal and Bill had made. It, the change became respect, how to play the game. Uh, you weren't there for yourself, you were there for the other 25 guys on the team. And if you messed up, those other 25, 24 guys would be pissed off. It wasn't that way in the early years. So it, as we grew and we got other players coming in, it became respected. You run when you play for the Astros. If we lose 24 to nothing, you better damn run. Because we're not going to sit here and have, uh, at that time we were still drawing 20 some, 30,000 people. But if you come to a ball game, you don't want to see a guy that's making, back then it was maybe $300,000 or 200. You don't want to see him not run. How do you tell your kid that this is the way you're supposed to play, hit the ball and jog the first base? We never did any of that. And Bur Burden was, a, was the key guy to that. Uh, it was almost like we were afraid to piss Bill off. <laughs> I mean, but it became where the veterans, and by that time, everybody got traded. Me and Cheo and Sedania were the veterans. And we ran. We knew we needed to run. It was just out of respect for Bill. So that's the changing of the guard. And from then on, the next, Probably it just flowed down. Biggio, Bagwell, you never saw those guys jog to first base. It was, a, it was thought of, if you would play for the Houston Astros, you're going to bust your tail. If you don't, somebody was going to knock you out. I mean, literally knock you out. They would drag you out or something. It doesn't happen anymore because Bill would take you and Bill would say, come. And he wouldn't make you sit at the end of the dugout. He would make you sit by him. So if you didn't, you don't want to sit by Bill Verdon during the game. <laughs> so you would have to come sit by Bill, and then everybody else would look at you like you were crazy. What, you don't run? Even the pitchers ran. People don't understand yeah. that. Pitchers don't run nowhere no more. They don't even work. Yeah. Yeah. But at that day and age, Nolan Ryan, J.R. Richards, all those pitchers, they ran the first base. Do you see that now? Hell no, you don't see those guys run. <laughs> but our pitchers ran. They stole bases too. If yeah. you go back and yeah. look at the thing, yeah. Nolan Ryan, J.R. Richards, because we couldn't score. You know, we would have won nothing to do the one. So the pitchers would take it on themselves, and they would steal bases. You think you see that nowadays? Hell no, you don't see that. So uh, it was just a changing of the guard, and that's, that's how we became what we were. But it was a, Tal is the architect of all of that, and it, I still love him, because I think he, he knew players better than anybody, but he made that team. If you came to Houston, you better hurry up and throw because we're running. <laughs> well, Enos, that's, that's, that's true. And part of the art of hitting, and Cheo and I always talked about this. We talked about it 10 minutes before we went on the show uh, up here. Is, and, and I want to address this with, with Jose Cruz because hitting seems like a simple thing. You see the ball, hit the ball, study the pitcher. But there's a lot, a lot, there are a lot more intricacies to hitting than what you see. And the beauty of what Cheo did and what Enos did, they were both great two-strike hitters. Cheo, you always had a good approach with two strikes, and you also did more than just hit for a high average and drive in runs. You moved runners over, and that's one of the most unselfish acts that's kind of almost a lost art. Talk about the way you approached hitting when you were coming up as a youth in Puerto Rico and, and when you were in the big leagues and, and how you developed into a good hitter. Well, I prepare myself to do good. And I, play, I always got in my mind that I'm going to play for the team. So I learned that from Puerto Rico. And when I come here, 
remember, like, first I used to play with St. Louis Cardinal. So, and the best thing happened to me when I got traded to Houston because I want to show St. Louis and I want to show the fans that I was a good player. But like Kenny said, my approach to two strike here, I want to say that when I used to have a two strike, I don't want to stroke out. I see a good pitch. I want to fire up so I can, you know, get a good pitch to hit. Plus, I never tried to pull the ball. I tried to go the opposite way most of the time, especially with two strike. So that was my approach, and, you know, it really worked for me. I was, I say to myself I was pretty, pretty good, but I was a lucky hitter. Chael, what, what do you think was the key? Uh, this team didn't score a lot of runs, as Enos alluded to. Uh, the leading home run hitter on that team was Terry Poole with 13 home runs, but you had a, a number of guys that were in double digits with home runs, but it was a team that hit for a pretty high average and a, and a bunch of clutch hitters. You guys talked about hitting a lot, didn't you? Oh, yeah, we talked about uh, hitting, but the, I remember those years I used to lead the team with 75 RBIs, 80 RBI, sometimes 78 RBI. Okay. So we don't score that many runs. We won a lot of game by one run, one to nothing, two to one. 3-2, that's the game we used to play. I mean, uh, I remember one year I hit, I don't know, about maybe 317. But I lead the, the team in RBI with, I think it was 90 RBI. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was, those, those years, that was good pitching. A lot of those guys, they in the Hall of Fame. That's right. Remember the other guy, Tom Seaver, uh, Alan <clears throat> Sutton, Caleb Perry. Nolan Ryan, I was pretty lucky Nolan Ryan was on my side. But, you know, I, was, I could have hit better. But, like I say, you know, we got good pitching those years. Deacon, let's talk about the approach to hitting and, and some of the personal things that you talked about. Because it's more than just the physical approach to hitting. Oh, of course, right. Right, the mental aspect. But, but in, in listening to Cheo, I remember coming, talking to him earlier. I said, Cheo, you come from St. Louis, smaller ballpark, you pull a lot. I said, you know, a lot of base hits the other way. And he used to work tirelessly hitting the other way. Same thing with Tony Gwynn, I'm reminded of. <clears throat> but Cheo was, became so adept at hitting the other, other way. And sometimes I would say to him before the game, that's how you feel today. You know, you scared, you're nervous? He said, yeah, I shake. I nervous. <laughs> I nervous. Okay. <laughs> I, know. I get him going. I, but he is always the same, same approach. Never worried about anything, never backed off from left-handed pitching, that type of thing. Um, Ennis was our leadership, took a leadership role. He'd cuss and swear and boom and holler at the pitcher or something. Throw the gas, throw the gas. He'd throw him a breaking ball and make him look bad. Why, throw the Why don't you throw the gas? You know, I, I, those things. And then there's a little old lady in Florida saying, that, Edith, come out. that guy on the third base, he always going down in his crotch somewhere. What's he doing? Why does he do his hand down all the time? I guess she didn't realize we had a cup. We wore cups. <laughs> I wore a cup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about, but hitting, yeah, we utilized the acidome. We knew we weren't going to hit balls out of the ballpark. Oh, we hit an occasional home run, uh, but moving runners and everything. And I just want to speak again to Bill Verdon, if you will. Bill, wow, he's a man's man. Being around that man, he was something. He, uh, he didn't back down. He set the rules, that's the way it was. I remember, if you guys remember, and Enos talked about coming out there and running, Bird Dog, Cliff Johnson. Cliff Johnson had a tendency sometimes to, uh, you know, forget, jog down the first. I think it was in Cincinnati, and uh, he had a pop fly. And man, everybody on the bench is screaming. You know, ball players get a fastball right there, and you swing, and you know you should have hit it better. And you said, dang, and you pop it up, and you tend to jog down. And they were screaming, run, run, run. Uh, and I'm just looking at Bill Verdon who's standing. And if you, know, if you know Bill Verdon, you know, and he gets a little upset, that vein just swells. <laughs> I mean, it's, I said, oh, Lord, oh, <laughs> And I knew it right after the game. He says, hey, nobody move early tomorrow morning. Come out and run. And of course, you know, one guy messes up, the whole team gets, gets uh, punished for it. And yeah, nobody likes that. And these guys, they could really ride guys with Enos leading the pack. But uh, I didn't want to get up at no 7 o'clock uh, in the morning. <laughs> but Bird Dog was really something, boy. 
why I didn't. Uh, Joe Negro would throw and, and Cliff, he would have a heart attack when he saw his name in a lineup. He had to catch him. Instead of being a receiver, he was a retriever. <laughs> He is amazing. Yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of times people don't understand where we had come from. Uh, in 74, 75, 75 when we first got here, we were terrible. I mean, we, we lost like, I don't Tal probably knows that. We lost, I think it was 13 games in a row, like three or four times. <laughs> and we still were playing. Uh, we had a manager, I think Preston Gomez was the manager at that time. And then they end up hiring Bill Verdon. And it was, it was like you were at a resort area. I mean, mm -hmm. guys would play golf during the day, and then they'd go play the game. We'd get our ass whipped, and everything was OK. <laughs> and when we got Bill, the whole atmosphere changed around there. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it became a thing where, are you tired of getting your ass whipped? That's what really Bill was insinuating. He says, are we going to play or are we not going to play? If you don't want to play, then every time somebody does something wrong, he didn't just punish that guy. And I'm a great believer in that. The more the numbers, the more they hated you. They wouldn't talk to Cliff for like two weeks. I mean, they wouldn't talk to him. We didn't want to talk to him because he caused us twice to have to get up at 7 to go run. And so Cliff got where Cliff was yelling at people to run. <laughs> so if you change the atmosphere, you change what happens in business or whatever. I mean, you can't have one not leading everybody else. Enos, I think it was like the year before, 1980, and we were in St. Louis, so we still had Cliff Johnson. I love Cliff. He's a San Antonio guy. I loved him. He was a sweet guy. But he and Bill didn't get along, and they were in the dugout in St. Louis, and Bill had taken Cliff out of the lineup, and Cliff took great umbrage at that. And I was trying to get some pregame notes and I got down there sandwiched between Verdon who had arms like Popeye and Cliff Johnson who had arms like Popeye. And I had arms that were not like Popeye and I was sandwiched in there going, good Lord, help me out of this. <laughs> Enos said, you look like you've seen a ghost. I said, well, just the faces of Cliff and Bill that were about to go at it in the dugout. I barely got out alive, but fortunately, as you can see, I did survive. We're going to walk you through the, in the last 15 minutes here. I, I, I want to spend some time in talking about the end of this season. The Astros were 93 and 70 that year, and yes, that adds up to one more game uh, than regulation. And that's because they had a three game lead going out to Los Angeles to end the 1980 season. And it was pretty much assumed by the writers and the fans here in Houston that they were going to win one game in L.A., even though the Dodgers were a very, very good team, loaded with pitching, and we know about the Dodgers' historically good offense uh, back then. The Astros lost all three games at Dodger Stadium to end the year, and so it ended in a tie, forcing a one-game playoff at Dodger Stadium the next day. And I remember going around, to, and I want to get the comments from both from Tal and Deacon and, and Jose and, and Enos, I remember going around to the locker room, and this is why I knew the hope was not lost. Number one, Joe Necro was a back-to-back 20-game -back winner and knuckleball pitcher, and, uh, well, it took a little drinking with him that night uh, before the game at the Biltmore, but I loosened him up. <laughs> Made him think that he was his brother, Phil. He always had that in the back of his mind. Joe never thought he was deserving. I said, you won 20 games back-to-back. -back. You're damn good. I really I told him that. But I want to get these guys, the last three games of the year they lose in L.A., they got one playoff game, 19 years of baseball here in the major leagues, and getting the first division titles riding on this one game after they lost all three at Dodger Stadium. It's a day game. Enos, you guys were not intimidated, were you? No. Well, we went in there. I mean, we had, we had five guys that could really pitch. And I said, there's no way in hell they can beat us three games in a row and definitely couldn't beat us four because Joe was going to pitch the fourth game. Uh, we didn't have JR at that time. And I don't know if a lot of you might remember, we lost every game by one run. And it wasn't like we were not playing well. They just did some. I think they hit maybe two home runs in that first three to beat us in eighth, you know, ninth inning or extra innings. And we just felt that we could not lose to them. And it was meetings and stuff going on. And, you know, we weren't a big meeting team because we knew how to play and we knew what our job was and what we had to do. 
And then we end up losing the third game, and it was a whole bunch of stuff led up to that. Cheo dance on the table, buck naked. I mean, it was. That's how he broke slumps. <laughs> Cheo would break slumps I mean, that it's, way. It's a whole lot of stuff that led up to that, and we had a. <laughs> he would. Well, yeah, that he, was he, a, he, Cheo, Cheo, tell everybody that story. story. Well, the reason was we lost three in a row. I say, listen, guys. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna dance naked, no clothes. But we gotta win the game. So we won the game. After the game, I had to dance with no clothes. <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> on the That's table right. with the spread, the where the food was on the table. That's right. They had the buffet table there. Craig, <laughs> Craig Reynolds, who was closer to being a minister than a nasty baseball player. Craig Reynolds said, "I think I'm gonna pass on the salami." <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, Deacon, a, a, a Deacon address, address that the, the game against the uh, Dodgers, they had Fernando Valenzuela, who had come up, but they didn't start him. They started Dave Goltz, yeah. who was their million-dollar pitcher. You're, what, you got, what you said to the hitters with Joe Necro on the mound, because it winds up Astros winning 7-1 to one and going on to the series with the Phillies in the NLCS. to get to that lineup. All those guys had, what, five guys hit 20 home runs, from Baker to Say to Garvey to... It was a Reggie, but I remember in that game, um, these guys were nuts. We, you know, with Andujar, Lemon Jello, Lacordy, you never knew what was going on with these guys. They didn't say anything. Before the game, while the Dodgers were taking batting practice, they were all screaming at them, we're going to kick you. So we don't kick you. The Dodgers look at, I said, look at these guys. I said, Skip, look at these guys. They're nuts. And they say, and they, we got Nuxy, and Nuxy was be in front of the dugout doing like this, smiling. And we're done. We have to win this game. They were loose as a goose. That's the kind of club they were. They believed in themselves, and as it was. It, it Cheo, in the uh, outfield at Dodger Stadium, in that uh, playoff game, there are people throwing fruit at you, like oh, bananas, yeah. orange, all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, they do that to me in Chicago, too. <laughs> <laughs> To throw all kind of stuff on my eyes, apple, <laughs> bananas, but I never uh, got a, intimidated. A, exactly. And Cheo, I remember um, going to you before that, uh, the, the night after the, uh, the, the after that uh, third loss in a row, and I don't think you thought there was any question you guys would win that playoff game. I said, we're prepared to win. We, we only need just one game. We lost three. I know we're not going to lose four. So I've got to do whatever it takes to you know, wake those guys so they can win. Tal, you knew too. I don't do it's, much. I don't you, do. You knew hitting. too. You knew too that it's hard to beat any team in baseball four times in a row, much less a good team like the Astros were. So I'm, you felt confident too. Yeah, that series in LA was remarkable. I mean, as uh, as you pointed out, and Enos, Enos and the others have commented. Uh, saying we lost all three games by one run: four to three, uh, two to one, and three to two, I believe, all with late inning mm -hmm. home runs. And. Well, no, but I think the thing that made the difference in this 1980 club, which is so dear to me, uh, is that there was a lot of talent. What well, the pitching was extraordinary, the starters and the relievers. And, and, and it's interesting, in those days, as we talked about it just before we started this is, uh, this morning, it's then Sambito and Dave Smith were the two principal relievers. Uh, Smitty averaged almost two innings in appearance, Sambito an inning and a half in appearance. In other words, you know, the composition of pitching was a whole lot different. But my point is, is, we had talent, had great pitching, had tremendous speed, had the best outfield of baseball. At that, at that time, as, uh, Stan War, as it wins above replacement, was, uh, was, was not commonly known. And obviously, thanks to you and many uh, in this room and many others, they've gone back and updated records. And I went back and looked at the Astro outfield in 1980, ranked number one in wins above replacement with Cruz, Cedeno, and Poole. So, I, but I, so my, my basic point is we had talent, had great pitching, had great speed, very good defense. What made the difference was the character of this club. The personalities were absolutely unbelievable. It's that guys like Cheo mm -hmm. and Enos and Cesar Cedeno until he got hurt in, 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 in game three, and Art Howe, ju just, just the attitude. These guys weren't gonna lose, and as I pointed out, it was, it was a club uh, that just had a lot of fun, uh, never intimidated, 
believed in one another, even though they were diverse personalities and mm-hmm. difficult for Bill and, and the coaching staff to man. I mean, you get you get Joaquin Andohar and and some of these other guys in a ball club. It's a real interesting challenge. But but the personalities and the conviction these guys had, they were just winners, each and every one of them, and particularly these two guys sitting up here. I'm going to talk about the Phillies series and how that ended. We've got about 10 minutes left. I promised I'd get everybody out on time. We're going to do that. Uh, Joaquin was a special personality. Uh, when I was writing for the Post, this is what happened. You remember when Joaquin was famous for being quoted as saying, one word says it in America? You never know. I said, Joaquin, that's three words. He goes, Kenny, you print this in the paper as one word. You <laughs> never know. And that's how that became famous. Enos, talk about the Phillies playoff. There's, uh, you know, there's five games, obviously, and they win the last game, but it's four of those five games that goes extra innings. You didn't have JR, obviously. We did have Vern Rule and came and did nicely. But People forget that that's a Monday playoff against the Dodgers. The NLCS opens the next night in Philadelphia, and you guys still battle them down to the very last out of the very last game in, in, against the Phillies. Yeah, well, it, I mean, everybody thought that we were, we were not very, very good. We were going against the great Phillies. They had everybody. Uh, they had the Smiths and the Lezinskis and all of that. Uh, all year, we didn't care who we were playing. Because if the game was close, we'd rather play a game that was one to nothing or two to one or three to two because we knew we were going to score a run some way or another. Uh, I'd get on or Terry get on, we'd move him, put him over at third, and then Cheo would hit a little chopper and we'd score. They always wondered how we could score so quickly because of that was the speed. Well, we didn't have to do a lot. But that series was really disheartening because we had worked for so long. Me and Chael had been here since 75, and we would go to the World Series. Uh, I don't, some of you grew up here or were here then. When we left from Houston to go to L.A. for the last series, uh, we used to fly out of uh, Hobby at that time, old Texas International Air, uh, planes or whatever. And the people were lined up. I mean, it was, when we got on the bus in the dome, they had to bring the bus in, nobody had left. I don't know if you were there or not, but the people, 40,000 people were still in the dome. So we left out of there and people lined up all the way to Hobby. And we said, we have to win. And we win and then we go to Philadelphia and uh, all those games, we probably could have won all of them. The key, there's been key factors in that series all along. And I don't know if you remember that last game. We were, what was the next to last game? We were up next by three. Game. And everybody, I don't know yes. if you remember uh, Gary Woods. He was a utility outfielder. Uh, fly ball to left field. Greg Lazinski, who probably all of you could throw better than him. Uh, Woods tagged up too early, and he was out. So we lost a run. We would have been up by four runs. They came back to tie us up with three. And we lost that game. We should have won right there. And it was a very simple play, things that we never did wrong. I mean, we've, we've, we didn't make mistakes because we couldn't afford to. But a lot of people don't remember that. I still blame Gary for my damn World Series ring. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chael, uh, Chael, talk about your remembrance of, or the memories of the, of the Philly series that ended badly, but also in the same context, the 1980 season all day. I'm sure all of that, I know it ended badly uh, in losing to the Phillies, but the whole 1980 season had to, you'll never forget that. No, I never forget that because you know what, that was my own, I would think it was going to be my first chance to go to the World Series. And plus, I lost MVP for the team. I was too good that year. I was one of my best playoffs. I, I would walk a lot and then, like you know, say, when I got a man in base I'm in those situations, and most of the time I come up with a base set. I was pretty, pretty good, lucky hit it in the clutch. And you don't see that anymore happen with the team. I think I was the last guy to be one of the best clutch in the, in the game, clutch hitter. And uh, to me, we got a good team. I mean, we lost because, uh, you know, it's happened in the late inning and the pitcher don't come back and I say a reliever, they don't do the job and we lost the game. We lost a lot of the close games, four to three, we're winning, we lost in the training. That was history, but that was the best playoff ever for me. 
That's in the history, the best playoff ever, 1980. And Tal, I think you agree with that. You've been around baseball more than 50 years, and even though the Astros had a remarkably similar situation in 1986 with the Mets, they also lost that, but no humiliation there at all because of the way that came down. But the Philly series was probably special to most of the people in Houston because it was the first time the Astros had won a division title in the history of uh, the major leagues here. Yeah, it was our, it was our first championship, but I, and uh, I think that 1980 LCS in the National League I think was the most exciting, most dramatic. And when, is there anybody in the room that saw that? Anybody get a chance to see any portion of the 80 playoffs? It was remarkable. Uh, it's, it's a pretty good show of hands here from a standpoint of attendance. As, yeah. as, uh, as Kenny pointed out, we had to fly from L.A. to Philadelphia, uh, lost, lost game one, as I recall, three to one, came back and won uh, game two in extra innings in Philadelphia. Uh, scored three or four runs in the tenth inning to win that one. Came back home. Game three, another remarkable game. Went extra innings, uh, 11 innings as I recall. Scoreless at that time. Joe Morgan triples. Uh, Landestoy runs for him. They walk the next two hitters. And uh, then we got a sacrifice fly from Denny Wally. The sack fly and won that one to nothing. Uh, so we're, we're up two games to one. That time the LCS was the best of five need more, one more win at home. Uh, game four, uh, I'm sure many of you in this room will, will, will remember this or have read, a, read about it, the controversial play in the fourth inning, Vern Rules pitching. First two guys get on in the fourth inning, uh, there's nobody out. Uh, St. Gary Maddox hits a ball back uh, to the mound to Rule. Uh, <laughs> it's close to the ground, questionable as to whether it's a catch or a trap. Uh, Vern maintains that, that, that he made the catch, throws to first base to double up one runner. Art House playing first. He runs over uh, af after a short delay to second base, tags that uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, get the third out with the runner that had left second base. Uh, Phillies are protesting, squawking. Ends up in a 20 or 30 minute uh, delay of play. Doug Harvey's a home plate umpire. Uh, Chubb Feeney, the National League president, is in attendance. A long controversy, as I said, for 20 or 30 minutes. Is it one out or three outs? Uh, if the ball is trapped, it would be one out because he, he threw the first and retired, the, retired Maddox, the batter. If he did make the catch, it's three outs because he doubled the runner off of first and Art Howe doubled, ran over and doubled the runner off of second. So it's one or three outs. You know what the decision was? Two outs. <laughs> That's right. And on the, on the on the premise that time had been called before Art Howe ran over and touched second, second to double up the runner That's there. But that 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 was game four, and we subsequently lost that in extra innings. Game five, the deciding game. Uh, Nolan Ryan's on the mound. We go into the eighth inning with a five to two lead. I think Nolan's got a two hitter at that time. We're six outs away from the World Series. And uh, unfortunately, things didn't work uh, right. There was, the, there was a bunt base hit. Uh, then uh, Bob Boone, as I recall, hit a ball back to Nolan, deflected off his glove. A potential double play ball didn't work out that way. Turns out to be a base hit. Uh, Rose gets walk. a big walk after, after Nolan was ahead of him 0-2. And, two. and uh, then uh, the Sambito comes in. Gets an out, I think. Kenny Force comes in. Anyway, they totally score five runs, uh, take a seven to five lead. These guys come back and tie it up in the bottom of the uh, in the bottom of the eighth. And uh, then uh, we, we go through the ninth inning and uh, lost it in the extra inning uh, on a on a base hit. The uh, toughest loss. I, I heard Nolan. Uh, I've heard or I heard Reed Ryan speak yesterday morning that that is the toughest loss in his dad's memory, in Nolan's memory. Hmm. I think many of us here would share that same thing, hmm. toughest loss we've experienced in baseball. But it was a great, memorable series for a great club. The 1980 Astros were, a, were just a, a tremendous collection of great individuals that gave everything they can on the field and were a lot of fun to be around. It's like Joaquin said, Tal, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to get you out on time. I am. How about a round of applause for Enos Cabell, Deacon Jones, Tal Smith, and Jose Cruz.